G'day, welcome to the New Sparrow Podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Isaac Shrek Daly. Unfortunately, I'm not joined by Turbo today, but we have got one awesome guest lined up. His name is Rob Harrison, and he comes recommended from a listener just like you. Vaughn Podbielski says, uh, he, he reached out to me and said, I take part in a spearfishing dedicated training group uh, like pool fitness, CO2, etc., uh, lake depth training called Spearfishing Fundamentals, run by a good bugger called Rob Harrison. Rob's an Ada instructor, and uh, he's actually a master instructor. So I reached out to Rob and jacked up an interview with him, and he turned out to be one hell of a character. And uh, today's a really interesting episode if you're interested in starting like a spearfishing club or a spearfishing training group, uh, whether it's just with three or four of your friends or or whatever it might be. And, and Rob sort of um, lays out some ways to think about how to go about growing a, a, a community um, built around spearfishing or training for spearfishing and uh, he he had a lot of success uh, with the team growing the Auckland Freediving Club they grew up from half a dozen people to about 120 in three years and uh, spearfishing fundamentals is a is a is a is a new effort and uh, they've got about 20 or 30 or sorry about 30 regulars and uh, and these guys train together and improve their freediving performance for spearfishing and uh Today's, like like I said, there's a lot of sort of valuable insights today about how to grow a spearfishing community. I'm not going to take too much of your time. Not many shout outs today. Just on Amazon.com, we got a review for 99 tips to get better at spearfishing. You can buy a soft cover version of the book on there now, as well as the audio book and the, and the ebook. Um, RLM says, great book for starting out Spiros. Very uh, A great variety of information, very well presented and organized. So thanks for that, mate. Uh, all right. I want to get straight into this interview with Rob, and we get some awesome insights also into hunting snapper, which is a very canny reef fish. So let's hook in. Adreno Spearfishing are today's a proud sponsor of the Noob Spiro podcast. They stock a huge range of equipment that you can find in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, and now Perth. That's right, spearfishing.com.au have got a huge range of gear. I encourage you to get along, use the code Noob Spiro, N O O B S P E A R O, and save yourself $20 on every purchase over $200 when you shop online. G'day Noob Spiro community, today I am joined by Rob Harrison and uh, we, we're in for a cracker today, he's come recommended from a listener Vaughn Podbielski who trains with uh, Rob a, in a group called Spearfishing Fundamentals and uh, so Rob's kindly joined me and we're going to get a um, we're going to get a good story going today I think Rob, H- how are you going today? Box of birds mate, no I'm uh, really looking forward to it, uh, I want to say thanks to Vaughn for the uh, recommendation, actually uh, it all happened pretty quick and I'm uh, stoked to be chatting to you guys, I've been listening to your podcast for, for ages actually and uh, yeah it's uh, it's great to be involved. Yeah and you know a number of the same characters, we know you, uh, Anthony Harfocker um, and you've had a lot to do with the Auckland Freediving Club and we've, we've been talking a little bit, we, I mentioned the Spearfishing Fundamentals group but um, look tell us a little bit about your background, how did you get started spearfishing and freediving? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I pretty much started snorkeling, you know, since I was knee high to a grasshopper. Um, my father got into playing um, underwater hockey in a small small town in NZ called Te- in Thames, um, and he was just training with a bunch of scuba divers. And um, I must have been about seven, I suppose. And I just used to snorkel around and follow, watch them play, and kind of, um, you know, I got really enthused about uh, snorkeling and, and getting into that sort of stuff. And you know, a couple of years later, I started playing it a bit and um, did that. It didn't take long to progress on to grabbing a Hawaiian sling, and my um, I'm kind of lucky that my my family have got some land on Great Barrier Island. Um, my father's got 17 acres there, just oh, sort of wow. above the, the wharf in Trifina. So I'm not sure if you've been there or not, but no, I um, haven't. Wow. Just spent out most a lot of our summers out there, and I, I was pretty much in the bay with a Hawaiian sling, you know, chasing Perori and Red Moki <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, Flounder and, and so forth. Um, yeah. yeah, and I was just super lucky to have that opportunity growing up. And um, there were also scallops out a little bit further. And once my father sort of showed me how to equalize, they also became a bit of a, a, a staple. Yeah, yeah. Um, how old are you, yeah. Rob? Sorry, how old am I? I'm yeah. uh, 43. Oh, so, yeah. I was going to. Yeah. I, I lived around the Thames area for a little while. I was actually in Pyro and then um, down in Wonga Matar for a year. I did my um, scuba diving instructors there. 
And uh, so I've, I've been around some of the same sort of area, I guess. Yep. Yeah. Who knows? We might have bumped into each other, eh? Yeah, that's... yeah, yeah. That's why I asked how old you were. You, you got a half dozen years on me, though. Um, all good. Um, all right. So where to from from there? Like, um, th- when did you get into like a spear gun and, and get it even more serious? Yeah, I, I, I kind of, um, you know, went on from snorkeling into actually did a bit of a phase of scuba diving, actually, um, a bit like you. So I started, um, there was a local um, on the barrier actually who operated the dive compressor from my father's land. And so we kind of had um, uh, unlimited dive fills, basically. We didn't charge him rent, but he, but he uh, filled, kept filling up the bottle. And um, I sort of spent a lot of time sort of hunting around the, the cell um western side of the barrier and just seeing a lot of fish and it kind of that naturally led on to hmm maybe i could ditch the tank and actually you know have a have a have a crack at doing a little bit more and um you know from there i basically went into i think it was wild blue which is darren shields uh a bit of a famous nz character yeah he uh, he sort of sorted me out with getting a one of the early rob allen um rail guns can't go and, wrong uh, yeah, can't go wrong, and I uh, used my underwater hockey gear, um, and pretty much, you know, got 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 right into it. Um, yeah, I kind of had a little bit of a break uh, through university and focused on other stuff, but got back into it again after after uni uh, with the underwater hockey crew that I yeah hung with. And now nowadays you're like an Ada master instructor. So how how did that progress after you got out of uni? What, when did you all of a sudden decide you were going to take on the the free diving seriously? Yeah, um, so I started getting into a bit of um, spearfishing just kind of more casually with with mates, Um, but really I kind of noticed there were two kind of things that were really holding me back a little bit, and it was um, one with breath hold, I really wanted to have a little bit more bottom time and be able to get a little bit deeper, and the other was really fish sense, just kind of getting a little more savvy about, you know, what's where and how to target things and, and so forth, and the you know, the, the former uh, around breath hold, I was actually talking to you know, one of the guys that you mentioned before, Anthony Harfucker, and he actually recommended the Auckland Freediving Club as an option. I was looking at doing a uh, freediving course, actually, Mike Smith, who I think you've mentioned a few times uh, from Ocean Hunter, he runs an intermediate breath hold course, which I was quite curious about and thinking about doing, but but Tony actually suggested to me that maybe join the Auckland Freediving Club, get a few runs on the board and then do the course, might be one way of going about it. Oh, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I've got into basically, you know, training with, with those guys. It was probably about five or six of us kind of regularly training at uh, an old pool youth town um, in, in, in Auckland. And, um, yeah, it was they went they had a bit of a basic induction. A guy, Phil Clayton, was club president. He took a lot of time and sort of explained the basics and got me up to speed. Yeah. Um, and then um, through over the years, I then did my ADA two-star and then three-star and then kind of got, got the bug a little bit, actually, and I really enjoyed the freediving aspects and noticed it was really helping my uh, my, my spearfishing a lot. Um, you know, for when I first started, I'd be lucky to do 45 seconds, maybe up to a minute sort of dives and, you know, 10, 15 metres felt like a big deal and, you know, through regular, regularly training, uh, managed to turn that into, you know, a couple of minutes of, of dive time and, you know, 30 metre dives, etc. that that you, you just can't get to that easily unless one, you're living in blue water and sort of training and, you know, spearing fish almost every day and that sort of stuff or if you join a club and it can really help your progression and actually do it in a really safe, structured way. Yeah, for sure, uh, for sure. Yeah, and and then from there, um, the fish sense, I just made a real point of, um, you know, following mates around, listening as much as possible. Um, I'm good mates with uh, Gary Conway, who's a bit of a New, New Zealand le- a Spiro legend. He's, uh, you know, back in the day, he, it was basically him and Darren that used to take out all the, the nationals all the time. He's, <laughs> he's still a, a very, yeah, he's a bit of a character. He's but, a fish uh, whisperer. He is a fish whisperer, actually, yeah. yeah. His nickname was always Cray Man, actually, because he, uh, he just seemed to be able to pull them out of nowhere, but he's just definitely got a, uh, a sixth sense when it comes to targeting fish. All right, um, cool. Yeah. Well, what, what, give, me a, give me a couple of the lessons you learned off him. Can, you, can Danny come to mind when you, when you, when you think of Gary? Um, yeah, actually, I have to confess, Gary was kind of the key guy that uh, a couple of years into my sort of spearing, like more seriously, I was got a little overly obsessed with just targeting kingfish and snapper. Okay. Um, and and one of the things he, he kind of pointed out to me was that like, there's so many other species you can target and actually make a point to not just default to going for kingies and, and, and snapper and actually have a really good think about different species like trevally and, you know, it might be Mau Mau or Pink Mau Mau or, you know, um, a whole lot of other species like Cherokee and just kind of start broadening your horizons a little bit with what you target yep, and, yep. you know, may, maybe fall back to going for the kingy at the end of the day if you don't manage to get anything else. But he was he was really good at just kind of opening up my 
eyes a little bit, actually, to be honest. And, and one of the key, um, yeah, key guys that kind of got me interested in doing competitions, just on the back of that, because he kind of he was often doing competitions on a regular basis, and kind of pointed out that, you know, if you've got a large fish list and you're needing to go out and target those, it's going to really make you think about, you know, what's going to be where, what the current's doing, and all yeah. that sort of stuff. And it, it, Gary can be a bit of a cagey bugger at times. So I remember uh, <laughs> one, one trip in particular where we we're out at the Ottoman Islands, actually sitting on the boat, and um, he was near one of his good cray spots, but he didn't want to give it away. So like we were supposed sitting in the boat, and I was going after you, Gary, and he's going, no, no, after you, Rob. You know, and neither <laughs> one of us wanted to get in first because he <laughs> he didn't want to share, share it. But um, yeah. no, he, he definitely over a few beers. He definitely was a little more forthcoming, and he's good mate. <laughs> He's good mates with a couple of other guys I play underwater hockey with as well, and they also took me under under their wing, a guy Craig Carter. Um, I spent a lot of time actually diving with him. We ended up doing a lot of competitions together actually uh, over the years, but he um, he was pretty open with you know wh- how he targeted um, the fish species, and, and and at times I'd actually leave the gun behind and I'd just actually follow Craig. Um, you know, we'd, I'd just watch to see how he targeted snapper in particular, and at that time I was kind of pretty hell bent on trying to get a decent snapper, and just kind of leaving the gun behind and watching how someone might approach an area, approach rocks, um, you know, go down and, and and low, and actually really stealthily, just making you know no no sound and being really slow and, and careful about how you approach it, peering around, keeping your gun back behind the the ledge so that the fish don't see it sticking out, and then even when you're out of breath, doubling back over the area that you've just covered. Mm. Um, all of those sort of tactics um, yeah, that okay. you know probably probably wouldn't have actually picked up as quickly if I hadn't have just left the gun behind and actually just watched what he was doing. Yeah, and um, right. I appreciate you know people like him actually made it much easier for me to kind of learn the basics because you know often you get onto the boat. And you're uh, you're chatting to you, everyone. Anyone's all friendly until it's like time to go, and then everyone just disappears. And suddenly, <laughs> like, oh, now now what? You know, and it's, um, yeah. he, he, he definitely uh, was was really helpful with me, and I I'm always make a point of trying to pay it forward too with when I go out with uh, new new people as well. It sounds like you do um, based on you know what some of the guys are saying in your group, Rob. Um, I was going to say the other thing that sort of come through loud and clear, apart from having a, a good mentor um, and Gary was. Uh, this, this idea of, of competitions sort of broadening your horizons and um, starting to really think because you've got you've only got you know king a uh, kingfish and a snapper are only two of the maybe the 10 or 11 species that you're chasing for that day so having to sort of think about okay how am I going to approach these fish is probably good for you know for everyone to think about doing in terms of um because you've got to plan an approach you've got to think what tide are they going to work on what sort of benthos are they going to be hanging around what are their food sources and all the rest of it so how did you sort of make that switch and what species did you start thinking about more seriously and and how did you you know what, what did that process look like yeah, um, mainly actually, yes, yeah, you know, in competitions often, um, I mean, yeah, it's probably no, no secret. It's kind of for me, um, one of my main strategies actually at the start is often uh, going for pelagic fish. So because they get tend to get scared, like your kawaii or your, your mau mau, you know, if there's a whole lot of sparrows charging at them and the trevally, they tend to get quite flighty. And so um, you, usually kind of having a think about, okay, well, that area there, I need to get a, a trevally or I need to get a kawaii or maybe the current's hitting that rock there. There and and that that would be a bit of a, a strategy to, to go for and kind of looking at the list um, and then having a think about strategies you'd actually often find too that other sparrows if you have a chat to them and you're trying to do a comp and you're trying to talk about strategy even after the competition you know about oh where did you go for this uh, then people are more likely to help you out and give you a bit of a heads up uh, that way rather than just hey tell me where your spot is where you get all your kahawai yeah, or yeah, get, yeah. get, get, get yeah. your, your trevally and so um, for me it kind of just served as a you know the first one and I think it was almost a down trail I think I might have basically just got a butterfish at the beginning you know and um, it was quite nice to see a couple of weeks ago the, the Mercury Bay open um, a, a, a couple um, that uh, basically Dylan and, and Emma from the fundamentals they decided to give her the competition to go and they only got a butterfish themselves but they really, really enjoyed it by mingling with the other sparrows and, and seeing what fish people have got and actually then having a chat to them about what areas. You know, people won't tell you exactly the, the spot, but they'll generally tell you the general sort of uh, method they use to actually target different species. I, be- um, I, but- believe, I believe a couple of Taranaki boys did well in that comp. Yeah, yep, no, they did actually, yeah. Old uh, Pat and Nathan. Yeah, they, they, did. they cleaned it up. And, um, and- no, nah, oh, they know. came see- they came second, actually, oh, yeah, my, oh. my mates. Uh, yeah, no, Pat, Pat and uh, Nathan um, actually almost put um, Kane and I, but it's actually, uh, you know, oh. Kane and I, we just, just managed to put them, actually. And, oh, uh, nice. But, Pat, but Pat, Pat and uh, Nathan did put uh, Mullins, Dave Mullins and, um, and uh, Mel Bird, actually. So oh, nice. it was right. 
a bit of a nervous way in actually. We all had a very similar number of fish. Um, okay. We got 16. Uh, Dave got 16, but Pat got 15, but actually a really big kingfish. And, you know, in competitions, you probably know, I don't know if it's in same in Aussie, but, you know, it's 100 points per species. Mm. Um, and then you, you can get 10 points per kilo up to 8 kilos. So you can get a maximum of 100, 180 points for any one fish. Uh, okay. um, so it was one of those weigh ins where it was like, could go any any which way, actually. It was, uh, but it was, it was good fun. Pat yeah. is always, always a solid diver, actually. Yeah, he, um, he's a machine. We, we, yeah, um, the, the other strategy um, in targeting actually um, in, in comps that sort of also broadened my horizon a bit, also coincided with my training, um, being able to dive a little bit deeper was actually being able to start to target fish off weed lines. Okay. And actually, um, funny you should mention that, pretty much for the first hour and a half or two of the Mercury Bay Open, actually Pat and Nathan and Kane, my buddy and I, we were kind of all trying to get ahead of each other across this, this quite long weed line, actually it was about a <laughs> kilometre long. <laughs> and so it was kind of like they'd zip in front of us and then we'd zip in front of them and one of us would get a fish and they'd go past. Uh, I, I think they must have flicked a bit of early back our way because we had a good run in with a bronzy actually that uh, I think they must have. <laughs> but uh, uh... but, uh, but Pat, Pat's also another guy who is just so generous with his um, – his knowledge and, and sharing and I remember I was really struggling to get snapper a number of years back and actually just couldn't quite figure it out particularly in competitions because it, it can be quite challenging you know it's not like you get a bit of virgin coast that you can just snoop yeah. um, and I remember he sort of said to me look you know just find an area that has um, you know the, the black perch with the dots on it or even other snapper around if you see them and actually get a bunch of canna and just put them over the edge of a ledge and just keep feeding the snapper until they go dumb and actually I didn't quite know what he meant by that but actually if if you leave it long enough and you keep feeding them, they tend to stop worrying about what else is going on and they just chow down and start enjoying the food. And uh, that's re- and he, he, yeah, he was gold, actually. I was really appreciated the, the fact that he took the time. And, and he does that for a lot of people. He's a really generous guy too. He does, he does. And he, he took me back out sparing last time I was back in NZ. Well, actually not last time I was back, but the last time I was back in the NACI anyway. And I uh, had a good time with Pat, and uh, I'll be doing that again for sure. You've just returned from another comp, haven't you? It was the Kings of the Coromandel comp over the weekend. <laughs> How'd you get, yeah. you, how do you manage to bloody get all this time to go spearfishing, first of all? <laughs> My my wife calls herself a Spiro widow over summer. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> she's um she's she's Japanese actually, and um I, I, I kid you not um I, I sometimes joke with her she should have to give back her passport because uh you know we do we do eat a lot of fish like snapper and kingfish and pretty much they've reached the point now where they're like oh not fish again for dinner you know <laughs> and uh, I tell her but you know she comes from fishing stock so actually that's uh you know that shouldn't happen it's, it's false advertising but yeah. uh, no my daughter still loves um. Kingfish sashimi, you know, like yeah, uh, she makes oh, me proud. Me too. <laughs> me how, too. How much she, she she gets stuck into it, but um, cheapest seafood's good in Japan too. Have you been over? Oh yeah, yeah. My my wife goes back once a year with the kids. It's just a you know good chance for them to practice their Japanese, but also I yeah I love the seafood there. It's um definitely uh, it it ruins you, and I love how well they present everything. It's you know it really inspires me a lot. We eat a lot of raw fish, and I I like preparing a lot of sashimi and um. You know, just, uh, yeah, I'd love to do a course one day, actually, on actually how to present it. But uh, I think the, those top chefs, they spend a lot of time learning how to cut it properly. And and oh, we'll come back to Kings of the Coromandel again in a sec, but did, did, have you been sparing there in Japan? Uh, no, I haven't, actually. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not even sure where to start. I have been kind of uh, tempted to, to find out a bit more about it, but uh, yeah. I understand they, they get quite good snapper in it's... some um, lo- locales. There's a couple of guys around that do spear there. Um, I believe there's a few guys that hang around the Reddit spearfishing thread, and there's another group on Facebook. Um, and there's a couple of Japanese guys that do chase buddies every now and then. But um, as far as I'm aware, it's it's almost illegal there. It's kind of a bit of a grey area. Um, yeah. But and I think down down further south and like. Uh, but I'm not completely sure about it either. So that'd be interesting. Where, whereabouts is your wife from? Uh, Kyoto. Oh, Actually, okay. yeah. yeah, beautiful so, uh, part of Japan. Oh, it's, it's awesome. Yeah, it's a lovely part of Japan. Yeah, yeah. I love it. But yeah, coming back to the Kings of the Coromandel. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, we uh, had some. We've got some family land over in the barrier, so we kind of figured, um, you know, uh, Julian was going to be pretty. Um, Hansford uh, yep. was going to be pretty pretty tough to beat, yeah. uh, given that you know he, he was he. From what I understand, he's been ground baiting uh, a few big snapper uh, <laughs> around uh, the Mercs, and uh, you know he definitely he, he knows the spot. So we kind of figured our best chance was, given I dive the barrier a lot, was to head out there. And I've got some some pins that actually produce some pretty good fish. Um, and uh, so Friday night we we kind of headed out at about 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, actually. 
pretty much uh, heading up by the moonlight. Yeah. Um, and it was a reasonably flat crossing out there, which was great. But when we woke up in the morning, it was blowing 20, 25 knots. It was not pleasant. So we kind of had a good crack at it. But a lot of the fish had actually gone in reasonably deep. Um, we did, um, Kane, my, my dive buddy, who we, we I dived Mercury Bay Open with, he, he did see, um, we sort of took turns at driving the boat and one person doing drift dives through this particular point. And we did, he did see some good, good kingies, but they just wouldn't come in. And um, we couldn't get out to a couple of the pins we wanted to. And um, we saw, you know, a few good snapper around the sort of seven, eight kilo mark, but nothing that was going to take it out. So we didn't pull the trigger because we just didn't want to scare the fish away. And um, unfortunately, it just got rougher and rougher. And we ended up having a hell of a trip home on Saturday night. Oh, um, I swear, swear I'm about two, two inches shorter yeah. as a result. <laughs> <laughs> it, how, uh, how big is that run when it's blowing like that um oh, it took us about two and a half hours it's, it was it was only about 18 kilometer distance from you know trifina up to port charles where um where he keeps his boat but oh it was a hell of a trip yeah right. and uh, and by sunday morning we pretty much decided that that was it we were going to go get a nice cooked breakfast and maybe just uh <laughs> cash up some uh, brownie points come home early and uh, save it for another day yeah, but yeah, um yeah. Oh, well, but I understand Julian did really well at it, so I didn't didn't get Matt make it to the weigh-in. But uh, yeah, I, I heard he'd uh, got a pretty good snapper and a good kingy. So okay, well, a day out on the water, still out day out on the water, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah, definitely. All right, all right. hey, let's get into um, one of your most memorable fish. Um, what what was it? Where were you? What happened? Um, yeah, okay. Uh, probably one of my most memorable fish um, was actually a forty-three kilo kingy that a uh, kingfish that I shot off. Um, little barrier actually about this time of the year, this year uh, about November time frame um, was probably three four years ago wow. um, and um, you know around November is typically when the bigger models do start to come in you know that's a little bit it's just starting to warm up and the bigger ones tend to come through and I jokingly had sort of said to I was out with um, my mate Craig Carter and um, George Napper, um, and uh, we, I was joking with them saying, I'm going to go shoot a big kingy and I'm going to get towed around for 20 minutes. So I actually <laughs> had said that to the guys, and they were like laughing at me like, yeah, whatever, <laughs> mate. You know, and um, I pretty much worked my way all the way along the southern side of Little Barrier. It was, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I used to do a lot of adventure racing, actually. Like, um, it was kind of, I got into it in a big way, like doing the coast to coast and 24-hour adventure races and all that sort of stuff. Okay. But um, after a few years, I kind of, I started to get a bit, you know, I was looking for something different and spearfishing actually became another means of me still getting those endorphins and, you know, the, the buzz that I kind of got from an adventure racing, you know, I'd often choose a, a section of coast and I'd go swim, you know, five or six kilometres and oh, wow. sort of use that as a means of, of, of keeping fit and um, it, like often I would kind of do stuff like that where I'd just say, right, I'm just going to work my way that, that whole weed line and um, I got about two thirds of the way through that weed line, saw so some, you know, really interesting fish and there was lots of, you know, boarfish and terakey and so forth um, and to be honest, I was kind of just enjoying it and kind of thinking, oh, well, we'll see what happens, see if anything big comes in and um, it was, yeah, about two thirds of the way through. And um, a big school of kingies came in, and I could see the ones in that were in the 40s, kind of at the back. And I just hung there and hung there, and it just wouldn't quite come in. So one of the tactics I often use for kingfish now is if if they're like that, then actually what I often will do is swim exactly the opposite direction. I'll swim, swim away from the kingfish. Yeah. Um, and it often, you know, I don't know if you're a cat person or not, but one of the things <laughs> I've noticed with, cat, with with cats, if you ever go into a household that has cats, if you want the cat to pay attention to you, you completely ignore it. And pretty much the cat, the cat will want to figure out why and try and win you over. And I swear, kingfish are the same. If they're almost like, why aren't you interested in me? What's going on? And um, <laughs> swimming away from it, and, and maybe it's also because your body language doesn't look like you're in attack mode. They get a little bit more curious. But um, yeah, it swam straight up to me, and it presented a you know a prime situation. I thought I might be able to stone it, unless I didn't. I got a good holding shot on it. But um, the little barrier now is actually getting incredibly sharky. There's a lot of bronzies, and and, and it's often quite hard to land fish. Yeah. Um, but the awesome thing with that is it took off like a rocket and just started swimming towards Auckland, like heading south. And uh, I just hung on to the float line. And, and, and I looked at my watch, and actually the total time, it took about uh, 17 minutes oh, from, wow. uh, from from when I'd actually shot it to when I'd finally managed to pull it in and then dive down and grab it and then uh, icky it. But um, it was a bit of a mission to then swim that back without the bloody uh, the sharks getting it. I sort of had to swim it right into the shallow, sort of half a metre, and then swim back about uh, three or four K in the shallows to get back to the boat. Oh, um, yeah, wow. But when, when we got back to the boat, though, um, 
uh, Craig's only had a set of scales that went to uh, 25 kg. <laughs> and uh, and so I was like, oh, how am I going to weigh this? I, I'm pretty sure it's a PB for me. And so I was oh, okay, I'll cut it in half. I took some pictures with the fish first, but then I thought I'll cut it in half and I'll weigh the first half. And <laughs> the first half went went to about uh, 20 odd kilo or, t- t- or so. And um, George Napa, um, he's a lovely guy, but he's got a bit of a reputation. He's, he's from the Cook Islands, and he loves raw fish. And he's had a bit of a rep of sometimes you'd be swimming past him, and the bugger will cut a bit off off uh, <laughs> off, your, off, off, your, off the fish and, and eat it. And I, I, while I'm weighing one half of the kingfish, I turn around, and there's George c- cutting into the other piece of kingy <laughs> and eating this of the kingfish raw. And I just had to say, what are you doing, mate? I haven't even weighed it yet. Mm. And he's, he's chowing down on the other half of the kingfish. But, uh, Sounds that one like a man to, after my own heart. <laughs> yeah, it's a top bloke. <laughs> so yeah, it went to forty three, and it was uh, it was a pretty um, pretty special fish actually. Uh, it, it gave us a lot. We ended up smoking it actually. It lasted a long time, but yeah, that one is one that definitely um, I'd, I'd love love to get another kingy that size again. It's pretty tough to do that uh, unless you head up to the three kings, but uh, you know, occasionally you do get big big fish. That's a bloody stonker. I want to head over and um, and chase one with with Nat Davy one day, and uh, we've we had him on the show and. He, he's a, he's a good bloke to chat to. I'd I'd love to get out there and have a crack at that myself. I, I um unlike a lot of other people, I I love yellowtail kingfish. I love eating it. It's just I, I I don't know why. I haven't had a bad one here in Queensland. Sometimes during particular parts of the year, they, there's something seasonal they get, uh, and um, apparently it goes a bit milky and mushy. I've not had one yet, and every one I've had, I I just love eating them. Sashimi, yeah. cooked panko crumb. Anyway, it goes. I, I just love them. So, but everyone, yeah, everyone's got their own preferences. They're they're a really underrated fish. Actually, in Japan, my wife sort of told me that the kind of nickname for them is the fish that kind of spoils as soon as you catch it. Um, you know, the, and and they don't actually often do a lot of um, kingfish for sashimi just for that reason because it's hard to keep, get it fresh enough that people still still like it. I mean, the, they still do. Um, but actually, I tell you what, it's one of the most underrated fish um, for, for sashimi. The, I, I often quite like to do a carpaccio style recipe with it, where I just sort of grate a bit of um, a lemon zest onto it, you know, use a little bit of um, lime juice or lemon juice over it, um, and then, you know, cut it quite thinly ahead of time, and then uh, put some red onion and capers onto it, and a little bit of balsamic vinegar. And I tell you what, mate, at a party, it goes super fast. Even people that don't like sashimi normally, they uh, they chow down on it. Really simple, but actually, it, you don't have to do a lot to the fish to yeah to get a really good feed. Eh? Jeepers, you you you're the, you're talking about you you're one of the best guests I've had for getting my mouth watering. <laughs> <laughs> well, come come visit sometime, mate, and I'll uh, yeah we'll do a cook up. Yeah, actually, yeah. Um, one of the when I was a couple of years back at the. Um, uh, when I was part of the Auckland Freediving Club, um, we did a, 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 a competition. One of the things I'm really keen on is actually introducing uh, people to competitions. And, um, you know, when I first got into it, if it wasn't for Craig and Gary kind of taking me under my wing, under their wing, then I, I probably wouldn't have really had the courage to kind of venture into it. Because it, 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 it's not that it's a closed shop. It's just that it can be quite daunting to kind of break into, you know, doing an event with like the Duanes and the Julians and, you know, really yeah. top guys. And you just don't even know really where to start. And, um one of the things I really wanted to, to do was actually just make a friendly competition. And, we, and actually, that's where the fundamentals name came from, where we I went out to a spot off the Noises, which is down the Haraki Gulf, and I kind of marked out where some kingfish were, where some snapper spots were, you know, where red mullet were, butterfish, scallops, and some mussels, and I made that the zone. And, and a couple of weeks prior, we actually did like a couple of seminars on how to target each of those fish for the oh. people that were inter- interested in doing it. Awesome. And, and then uh, what we did is actually paired up an experience bureau with a couple of junior people from the club and we they put in, were put into teams. They had four hours to go out and actually target all those fish. And most people actually got the, the complete list, which was great. And But they'd only actually um, made up half of the score of the of the competition because the other half was you then had to cook everything or prepare everything that you'd spared. And, and that then got judged by the group. And Ooh. we all sort of all came back and did, a whole bunch of people did great sashimi dishes and some people did really, you know, um, couple of the Al Brown, um, you know, dishes with the kingfish and kahawai and other bits and pieces. It was, uh, it was a great way to do it because it not only did it kind of teach people how to target the fish, but also showed them how to prepare the food and fillet it and so forth. And it was, uh, it was a really fun way of doing it. We're actually thinking about doing a combined fundamentals crew and the Auckland Free Diving Club. We want to do the same thing again in January. Yeah, I, was, was, I, was, I, was, I read a bit about that in um, one of the emails you sent me and I thought, I thought it was a really clever concept for a comp, especially like a bridging comp, you know, like where you're trying to get new blood through. Because like yeah. you say, like you show up at a comp and 
you know, Ian Puckridge there or Dwayne Herbert's there. I mean, you're just going, yeah, I just showed up to talk and hang out with you guys and uh, and hopefully spear a couple of fish. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. But so that that sounds like a clever idea, and um, yeah, I'll, I'll be like I'll be interested to promote that on the podcast when you guys um, get a date locked in. Yeah, nice one. Yeah, well, I'll send you through some more info about it. Um, but yeah, no, that'd be that'd be great. Yeah, cool. All right, hey, um, what's your favourite species to hunt, and um, and what technique do you use to hunt them effectively? Um, yeah, I, I, quite, I like to mix it up, but you know, um, definitely kingies we've kind of already talked about. Snapper are always fun because they're just wily little buggers. You know, they um, that you often get. You know, the, the, probably half the time. You know, the, the big ones uh, they I just can't quite get close enough, or for whatever reason, that's always a bit of a thrill to chase. But um, more recently, I, I really like to target um, weed line species. So for us, we get the giant boarfish and, you know, terakee up, up north. Down south, the terakee are kind of almost everywhere, but up, up, up north they're a lot harder to get and not as many of them, and you typically have to dive a bit deeper for them. Yeah. Um, you know, th- those sort of species, John Dory, et cetera, um, I really just enjoy um, going out somewhere a little bit deeper. My mates and I, we kind of have a bit of an unwritten rule. Whenever we're weed lining, we're always pairing up. So, you know, snapper, we were a bit, bit shallower. You know, we tend to kind of dive well within our limits and, and, and sometimes we'll split up and have a bit of coast to ourselves. But any time we're diving, say, deeper than sort of 12, 13 metres and we're going out to, to weed or out to weed lines and going a bit deeper than that, we always pair up and maybe do, you know, two or threes um, and, and actually do it with people that we know can actually rescue if, if that's needed you know like we often will go out and practice um how to how to do rescues with each other and make sure that we're kind of competent with that sort of stuff but um yeah i, I really like weed lining um just and, and the sort of technique that i use for that is um really two main strategies one of them i'll often go into the weed and i'll just sort of hang off just off, off the edge of the weed line okay. um h- hiding in the weed and i'll i might make a little bit of noise but stay out of sight and sometimes uh, that, that'll bring in the fish and, and my what, other strategy what, what noise uh, do you make um, I'll often just um, bang the handle of my, my gun against my weight. I typically move one of the weights around a little bit um, past my hip. Okay. And so it's in a really good um, position for just tapping the handle against. And, and often that sound tends to attract quite a lot of fish. It definitely brings kingfish in. Uh, it's a good strategy for them. Okay. Um, you know, some people strum the rubbers, I know. But actually, I've often found t- just tapping the handle actually is uh, effective as anything. Um, and, and, and it tends not to scare away, um, you know, the terakee the and, and, uh, and, and other species like... Um, my other strategy is actually sometimes just to go right off the edge of the weed line and actually dive down and just lie on the sand, put your fins down nice and flat, look straight down and just waft up the sand like you're as if you're eating something from the bottom. Yep, yep. Uh, and um, that typically will the fish tend to go nuts more often than not. If you just lie there, you know, and, and this is where obviously your, your, your breath hold practice really comes into its own. And actually, interesting enough, that, that particular tactic of um, going out to a weed line and lying on the sand, um, I often use that as a means of, you know, some dives when you're heading out, the heart rate just won't settle and your bottom time's just absolutely rubbish. Um, you know, sometimes doing lung stretches ahead of time helps, but actually I find one of the most effective ways of just settling myself down and getting my dive response working really well is actually going out and doing that, lying down, gliding down the last little bit of your dive and just sitting on the sand and just absolutely trying to lower your heart rate and relax as much as you can. Um, yeah, right. I, and I, I find that that often settles me and then my, my bottom time will almost double sometimes as a result of that. But that particular tactic of just lying there, you'll often find the fish will gradually start to work their way back in. Terakee in particular, more often than not, you'll turn around and they'll all be sitting at your fins looking at you you know um, yeah no, and, I, th- uh, I think that's a universal that, that, that technique works everywhere I just never really thought about it in terms of um, helping it you know calm your dive response down and get it get it active anyway and then and, and getting you calm and in the right headspace for for, yeah. for, for free diving that's that's friggin excellent yeah, it certainly works for me, and I know a couple of my mates also use that tactic too. Mm. But um, yeah, so weed lining. I mean, I, I love targeting the the giant boar fish as well. You know, they're a real tasty fish. They're kind of halfway between a kind of a, a John Dory and a and a and a um, and a scallop, really. And um, we're, <laughs> oh, wow. we're we're lucky to have them. Actually, they're they're. They're a great fish, actually, really, really tasty and um, quite curious. You know, it's really neat when you see big schools of them, which yeah. you sometimes get. I remember chatting with Dwayne a fair bit about him when in his interview. Um, I've never shot one myself. Um, and uh, are they are they prolific? What's their breeding cycle like? Are they slow growing? Because the the big ones seem to be quite 
quite rare. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I have to confess, I don't really know actually how, how quickly they grow. I, I certainly know that the the numbers have definitely started to, to bounce back, um, and whether that's because of um, the fishing practices have changed a little bit. But um, I'm seeing more and more of them of, of late. It was funny actually with giant boarfish. I had uh, the first one I shot was actually out off Tyra on off the Coromandel, and uh, it was nine point nine kilo, and I had no clue that actually it was like three hundred grams off the uh, world record. I just had <laughs> no idea, and uh, rocked up to the. Uh, yeah. <laughs> to, wow. to the shore and there was a Nespero that actually knew what he was doing was going shit you should go get that thing weighed um, <laughs> it was actually in honesty it was a bit tough <laughs> at that point so uh, to be honest I think I'd probably uh, leave leave something that size if I ever saw it again just because uh, you're not going to get a good feed out of it so there's not much point what was the uh, weight but, on it again? 9.9 uh, 9 kilo oh <laughs> so, oh was, jeepers that's a horse have you got a photo of that? Uh, I do actually yep. I, I no, want to link that up in your show notes so people can come and take a look if um if if they'd like to, that'd be bloody that'd be bloody good. Um, so if, if people if people just bloody um, type in, uh, yeah, if, if if people just come to your show notes, they'll well, hopefully we'll be able to link one up in there. That'd be good. When you go to buy a shirt, you're probably like me. You are happy to look like a '90s dad. Now, sadly, that will not take you forward in life. <laughs> But I've got good news for you. Today you can go to noobspiro.com, support the Noob Spiro podcast and get yourself a great shirt that will make a difference. Perhaps you won't look like a 90s dad anymore as Turbo accuses me of every other week. If you pick up three girlfriends the first day you own your Noob Spiro shirt, it's probably a coincidence, but they are a bloody good shirt. Head along to noobspiro.com, go to the shop, grab a Noob Spiro shirt, Shirts for Spiros, by Spiros, for Spiros, about Spiros, everything Spiros. Nobespiro.com. Guys, head over to Vimeo.com. Check out the How to Spearfish video series by Luke Potts. There's nearly four hours of video training there, and they're divided into five different videos so far to help you take on the areas of difficulty that you might have. Now, there's a beginner's guide to spearfishing gear. There's a guide to how to increase your breath hold for spearfishing. There's techniques for spearfishing yellowtail kingfish, which also doubles as a guide to hunting pelagic fish. There's a, a guide techniques for spearfishing snapper, which is a really good, um, helpful guide for approaching canny reef fish, which is a tough one. And finally, a guide to spearfishing around sharks. If you want to buy any of these videos, use the code NoobSpero and save a bit of cash. Check it out. Vimeo on demand, how to spearfish. Let's let's move on. Um, we've teed up to talk about um, growing a club or growing a community, particularly because you've had a lot of background with Auckland Freedivers Club, and also, um, and more more recently, the Spearfishing Fundamentals Group. So I know here in Queensland, there's often talks about forming new spearfishing clubs, and um, it's a lot of work, and a lot of people sort of don't know how to go about doing it. We've also got a a freedive training group here called the Brisbane Bull Sharks, run by Wayne Judge, and that group attracts a massive following as well. It seems like when you can get these groups going with the right ingredients, um, it's a bloody great thing to be involved with for your spearfishing, for your friendships, for having plenty of dive buddies, for improving your spearfishing fitness. So, really want to get in on this with you today, Rob. So, tell us a little bit about your your background, I guess, like. Um, growing the Auckland Freedivers, I guess, first and foremost. Yeah, yeah, sure thing. It was probably about six or seven years ago. Um, uh, as, as I kind of mentioned, I, I wanted to get it. Tony Harfuka, uh, Anthony Harfuka, put me on to the AC, and at the time there was probably about five or six people that kind of uh, regularly trained at, at the pool. Um, you know, it was pretty low-key. Um, and, and a good mate of mine who actually... Um, I've done many comps with over the years and done a lot of spearing with uh, Braden Lynch. He, he, he came back from the UK and then he'd actually been training with a group uh, called No Bubbles and they were based in London. And um, they were more of a hardcore kind of freediving outfit. Um, but, you know, he kind of talked about how often having a little bit more structure and a bit more vision uh, often will help a club grow. And over a few beers one night, we kind of went, right, what, what could we actually do with the Auckland Freediving Club? How could we actually really grow it into something really massive? Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, that was kind of a bit of a, a navel-gazing over a busy, but actually that kind of led <laughs> on to um, having a chat 
get that's those core five or six people and sort of talking about okay well what would be a really ambitious goal for us and kind of having a vision for what the club could look like so almost kind of calling out what, what's that north star what's that thing what's an audacious goal that actually might say what could we be what do we want to be and actually for us we said you know what let's let's try and be the biggest free diving club in, in the Asia Pac region and what would that be you know and, and actually that was kind of an ambitious goal was kind of where it started and and so everything kind of worked backwards from that from that we kind of called out you know key missions so from from that particular vision we kind of called out okay so what are the, the missions the things that why we actually want to train together and how we what we want to do and for us at the time actually I just kind of went through and had a recap and, I, and I'll send an example of this actually on the, in the show for you to put into the show notes if people want to see it but it's um it's actually something I pinched from uh, from work. I worked at um, uh, yeah a, a large corporate and uh, NZ, and uh, basically it's a framework that they use for their teams. Actually, I thought, well, you know, there's no reason why that same framework couldn't work for a club. Yeah. And for us, the uh, kind of key missions where we wanted to raise the profile of free diving and increase safety. We wanted to provide access to courses to people. We wanted to have structured and planned training, which was a big thing. We wanted to organise competitions and have opportunity for people to do you know personal best sessions. And we also wanted to do lots of social events. You know, ultimately, a lot of clubs are down to people. People want to do it as a means of, you know, socialising and meeting new people, and um, that was a really key piece. And actually, Anthony Harfuka came on board as the um, the events organiser and did a sterling job of that. Like that was yeah. definitely one of the key things that really helped with that. But we, we drilled on to each of those key missions and put out some key objectives, and we kind of called out, circulated that, and said, okay, this is what we think. This is where we're at. And we kind of started to circulate that wider. You know, Facebook was definitely a really good medium for getting out wider, and people would search for free diving and they join and actually in it we always had a rule of there was some talk about locking down the facebook site so that only paid members could get access to it but we were kind of like hang on we actually want to welcome the community and actually if we provide information that can benefit other people great but actually more often than not that's going to lead to people being interested in wanting to join the club yeah and and um, you know, promoting that, and actually just you know, doing regular inductions. We what we often did is we actually just ran inductions at a super cheap rate. I think it was like ten bucks to come along, and that included your your, your pool training. And we had lots of Spiros that actually came along and, and just wanted to learn some basic safety and better breathing techniques. And you know, probably two thirds of those guys didn't stick around as part of the club, but they were talking about it. And actually, initially we were kind of like, oh, it's it's not great to have people kind of coming in and not sticking around. But then ultimately we kind of viewed it as, hang on, these people are learning safer practice. Is they're learning how to breathe up before the dive. Yeah. They're learning how to how to do recovery breaths, which I know you've talked about on some of the other uh, podcasts. But you know all of those kind of basics. And mm. even if they don't, don't don't join the club, we're actually making people safer. So there's actually no downside to it. Yeah, and, yeah, for sure, hundred percent. And that and that in itself, you know, like there's a lot of movements nowadays, obviously in organisations, to start look at social responsibility and what you're, you're contributing to the wider society. And, and yeah. that becomes a, a really motivating um, thing for actually employees wanting to work for an organisation. Well, the same thing goes for a club, right? Yeah. If you see that a club is contributing and actually doing things, you know, they might go out and to help out with sustainable coastlines or they might, you know, do safety days or they might whatever else. People see that and they go, you know what, I want to be part of that. It doesn't actually, this is going to provide me a really good platform to be able to get involved in that and hang out with good people and do some good good stuff. And so that was a really uh, a key part of it. Another uh, really successful portion of it was actually we, we kind of had this pay it forward model where um, the club, you know, had a little bit of money in, in, in the bank. And what we actually did was we kind of had a um, – well, initially we were like the, the more experienced people. Um, we actually sent them on on training courses uh, to get even more experience, but we're under the view of actually that they would come back and help run those inductions and actually help out with some of the club activities. Yeah. And that, that whole model became really, you know, you, you could take the stance and there was, you know, at times we had some robust conversations about whether we want people to pay in advance and then we'd pay them back. But in the end it was like, you know what, let's put some faith in people and actually 99% of the time people are going to, you treat people like adults and you respect them, they're going to actually behave like them and actually do good good stuff and actually the amount of overhead to try and go you know for that one percent of people who don't actually um you know pay it back it just doesn't doesn't make nah. it worthwhile focus on the 99 percent and and what we did is that then started gaining a lot of momentum where you know we had more skilled people running inductions and people got more interested in that and that then led on to um us saying well actually how about we send four people in the club to become an ADA instructors uh and myself included Braden was also there and, and two of the other guys in the club uh, but the, that model was the club would pay for us to do our instructors, but actually we had to run uh, a, a X number of eight or two and three star courses for club members. But then that in turn meant all those other people that then did those courses then needed to do inductions and run events and so forth. Yeah. And so it started to snowball yeah, in nice. terms of actually the number of people. And it was all really down to having a bit of faith in people and actually, you know, investing in it. And and, and people paid it back tenfold. You know, yeah. it was um, 
it, it was awesome, actually. It was really nice to see. And, and that in itself creates a really good vibe in a club when you kind of can see people are doing it and they're doing it because they want to do it and they actually see that, you know, someone's actually put some faith in them and then they actually then lead on to, to doing other cool stuff for other people. Um, yeah. Look, uh, yeah. I'm 100% on board, Rob. Um, and a lot of the clubs, you know, all over the world um, have got some of these same ideas built in them as well. It just seems you've got some um, ingredients that kind of allowed you to do it. What's the kind of the core size, like minimum um, number of people you need to really sort of get a decent platform to launch something like this up and going? What, have you got a bit of a theory about the, the yeah. number of people needed? Yep, definitely do. Um, and actually, that was a really good lesson for me. Um, and this, if I had my time again, I'd do it a bit differently. Um, you know, it's a lot of th- there's a lot of research around team size. That is, as soon as you get beyond about nine people, like seven to nine, seems to be kind of a, a good number in terms of lines of communication and actually being big enough to be able to do make an impact, but not so large that it's really hard to communicate and get everyone on the same page. And um, the committee, you know, as we grew, say we got up to about fifty people, we were kind of five or six, you know, keen keen people. And we, as it started to kind of grow exponentially, we started to get more and more committee members and actually making more and more roles. And if I'm really honest about it, if I had my time again, I would have probably kept it to no more than seven, maybe eight maximum people on on the committee kind of driving it. Because when you when you start to get more people, you know, you start to – often it was kind of – it was funny. You'd think more people would be – would equal more people being prepared to do stuff. But what often happened was this kind of assumption of somebody else will actually do that or yeah. that's not, 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 not my role. And it oh, was – that's um, not my job. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. and but you also end up getting a lot more opinions that you then need to obviously Factory. work through and kind of get you know a zebra is a horse made by consensus. <laughs> and you know it's um, <laughs> I'm, I'm obviously getting old. I'm starting to quote my grandfather. It's a good dad but, joke. Uh, That's why I laugh. <laughs> dad jokes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and and it was kind of interesting. Another key learnings from that was. There were a couple of people that had pretty strong opinions and people that were involved in the club for early in the day. Uh, and, and what I did notice is uh, coming in and actually overriding people that were taking the initiative pretty much disempowered people along yeah. the time. And so they'd actually stop volunteering. And we ended up having to, to kind of do have a bit of an unofficial agreement that unless it's about reputation of the club or safety, if someone wants to do something and take the initiative, we support them 100%. And if they're going to have a crack at it, even if it's different to how you want to do it, you have to make it really clear that actually support them, give them a crack. Don't kind of come in last minute and kind of twist it to be you know the way that you want it. Because actually, as soon as you get to that situation, people will stop stop contributing and, and that, that's just you know death knell to, to clubs it's really hard and, and one of the techniques uh, I actually brought in from work is we ended up doing something called a social contract um, and that was actually us agreeing how we wanted to interact with each other and what expectations were oh, and, nice. and and, and what we did there was a pretty simple formula. Um, it was actually, we, we basically all just kind of said, okay, let's put, get some post-it notes or, you know, draw up some some ideas of what things we kind of think would contribute to good interactions as, as a club, what we expect from each other. Um, and we kind of we put all those up and then we just turned those into a series of sentences actually into how we want to be. And we all kind of agreed it and we all signed it. And any time that there was any interaction as a, as a committee, you know, or in the club that actually didn't reflect that social contract, anyone could call someone else out on it and say, hey, this is what we agreed. You know, we, we refined that over the time, but it was actually a really good tool for kind of taking the personality out of it, not making it Rob has to kind of put someone right here. It's like, hey, this is what we agreed. I feel like we're not actually doing yeah, what we yeah. said, acting the way that we wanted to. And and that in itself actually created this really healthy culture. Where we could have robust discussion, disagree even at times, but actually still commit to, you know, a, a, a path forward. And, and as soon as you can get to that situation, you know, you, you can just start to gain momentum. The club just starts growing and going from strength to strength. You know, it was... Um, it was pretty awesome. Uh, sounds, another sounds like sorry. You, tap, you, you tapped in some real to some really useful skills here, like cl- co-planning and um, you know agreeing with what you are and what you're not together. I mean, and and how you guys function together in a like a social framework sounds really clever, and um, it's it's really cool to sort of borrow a lot of these learnings from you know management and business where they've spent years and years researching this stuff and you know um, trying to make um, some of these things work where it's a not-for-profit you know um, even though you've got a great vision it's still a really hard job to make it all work so good stuff I, I interrupted you carry on Oh, no, no, I mean, I'm, I know I could go on and talk about this all, all day. I mean, it's certainly an area that I really – I enjoyed the whole process, if I'm really honest about it. It was so awesome to, to work with such a, an awesome, diverse bunch of people that were really committed to just to doing cool stuff. But one of the other things that we often did is um, we did retrospectives about once a month or, or so, and, and a retro you know, can take lots of different um, formats. But we'd actually invite anyone from the club that wanted to come along um, – 
And um, one of the other uh, tricks that we did actually or areas that kind of really helped the club grow is um, we're lucky enough in Auckland to have Lake Papuki basically uh, in Takapuna as the lake goes to about 60 metres in the middle yeah, um, right. so we've, we've actually we, we put rigs out there and we train there but we actually um, there's a rowing and a, and a kayak club um, club room that we actually we hire once once a, hired once a fortnight and everyone got together and we had a barbecue and, and quite regularly what we'd actually do with that is um, run a retro and we'd kind of reflect on anyone could just put up some points on what they thought we should start doing stop doing you know continue doing do more of and do less of and people just put all the different ideas up and then actually would sort of see common themes you'd group that stuff together and then anyone that was there could vote on everyone got three votes essentially for what they thought was the top item that we should focus on and so that way the group the collective was kind of deciding on the top items that we really wanted to improve as a group and we'd actually take those two or three top items and say we're going to nail these things and make it you know really improve it and actually really focus on it and actually you know use that as an area of improvement and actually um making the club even even better and, and that in itself made people feel like they were actually owning it and contributing to it and shaping the the club and it was a, actually a really really lightweight but really simple kind of way a, a mechanism for um getting people's buy-in and actually helping make things better and identifying what things the group felt like we needed to do to make things better mm-hmm. this is all awesome stuff rob all right I'll, i want to take it right back down to sort of the, gr- the grassroots level again um You've got four or five guys uh, and girls and they're interested in starting a spearfishing club. They've agreed to go and meet at a pub and sort of flesh out this idea. What? How would you advise them to proceed from there? What's kind of a, what's a great way to just start something off simple and really get the ball rolling? Yeah, I guess kind of starting starting reasonably small. You don't have to go big, big bang with it. You know, start start doing the stuff that you guys as a group want to start doing and, and really enjoy. And, and then, you know, gradually start inviting other, others into the mix. Um, you know, you, you can start pretty organically you know you don't you don't have to go and kind of bore the ocean on, on this sort of stuff you could just kind of say hey what are we about what do we want to do and, and at least getting everyone on the same page and just talking through what people would like out of it and seeing if, if there's you know the areas of commonality and actually then doing stuff that actually whether it's going out spearfishing on the weekends or whether it's doing specific training that you know maybe people want to get better at weed lining or something like that then if that's a common theme then you just start doing those sort of activities and and you know promote it on on, on facebook and actually just kind of put the word out there and often and, and the other thing I'd say is um, be regular with your training. Like, book a slot and actually just keep doing it on that slot. I think intermittent type stuff is actually really hard to gain a bit of momentum on, and that's certainly what we found in the early days in the AC is, you know, there might be some times when we first started where only two or three people would turn up, but you just got to keep committing to it. Yeah. Um, as soon as that became kind of intermittent, then, you know, people would never know if it was actually on or not and so yeah, forth. And yeah, yeah. you give. And the other key thing that we've, we found is actually using events and, and Facebook was a really good way of putting the events in a couple of weeks ahead of time so yeah. that people would actually see it and they'd add it to their diary you know uh, they can see it and, and it'd pique people's interest right and they'd actually go oh yeah I'd do that and if it's enough notice people will normally will prioritise it and they'll add it to their own calendars you know it was um, it was a really good feature a really good way of kind of broadcasting but giving lots of notice we certainly noticed you know when we reflected on it when we were starting the times that we put the events in a couple of weeks in advance we got a lot better attendance because people had more time to look at it and never think about it and they'd already kind of mentally invested in, in attending whereas you put it in the last minute you might get one or two people you know it's, it's pretty people's diaries get full and you know it's a lot harder to, to arrange but yeah as I said focusing on the, the common areas that the, the group wants to do and actually just really Starting to do those, you know, broadcasting what you're up, uh, uh, you, what, what what you're doing, and actually, you you often find that uh, those that are interested in doing the same things will will start to flock in and actually, you know, j- come and come and join you. Love it, love it. Hey, um, I was going to say the Auckland Freediving Club is not the only club you've had a lot of success with. You've um, you started yeah. spearfishing fundamentals with another bunch of guys. Tell us a little bit about that group. Yeah, um, I, and I guess that this is a little bit of a contrast to a slightly different way of, of creating a, a group. I mean, the AFC ended up being quite a, a monster. I mean, I think they're about 140 <laughs> odd, odd members now, you know, yeah, and it's, right. um, they ended up, I think they do about six to sort of 10 inductions a, a month, but they've capped it because they actually have, you know, it, it, it's it, it's a bit of a machine. Um, and, and I guess um, as it got larger, I started to kind of realise that, um, well, actually it was a bit of a turning point for me was um, my mate Braden, who I mentioned previously, he and I were, you know, getting quite 
quite keen on the free diving aspects and um you know we we're both diving in the 50 meters you know we we're actually going pretty hard out and, and, and started to progress but he um he got caught on the rig actually at about 40 meters and um he he basically managed to sort of he tried to untangle and then he um untangled his lanyard uh, but he, he couldn't and in the end he decided okay I'll, he'll, he'll pull the, the cord and actually start swimming up without it but he he kind of he grabbed up a little bit too high and pulled himself up really hard and actually which is a bit of a no-no when you're when you're diving deep and you're hitting residual volume you know when your lungs are compressed down pretty much as much as they're going to compress you want to avoid doing big big movements and yeah. so him reaching up and pulling he ended up giving himself quite a bad lung squeeze and Ooh. so he came up and he was coughing up blood and um we took him to hospital and his you know his o2 saturation was pretty low and, and for me that was a really sobering moment where i just sort of realized actually you know where do I where do I go with with free diving? Actually, I, I'm not really that interested in going. You know, being try, trying to get to 100 meters, it's kind of not something that floats my boat. I'd much rather target fish and hang hang for you know a couple of minute dive would actually I'd get more of a buzz from that. Yeah. And uh, that started to sort of form some of my thinking that actually you know maybe the AFC isn't quite um, what I want to do. I'm actually more interested in doing free dive instruction, which I still do ADA courses and teach free diving. But the thing that really I enjoy the most is actually doing training for spear fishing and actually bringing in those those uh, those free diving techniques and actually tweaking them a bit so that they're actually around uh, targeted towards um, spearfishing. You know, with free diving, it's really about you're going to do one dive and you're going to go as deep as you can, and it's just the one dive that you do during the day. And in reality, that that doesn't reflect what you do when you spearfish, right? Yeah, you're, you're swimming into current. You've got you know, fitness that you need to do. You you know, and, and actually being working up a bit of a sweat and swimming into current and still being able to dive and hang down is a different sort of fitness to what you do if you're doing one single long. Um, long, long swim, yeah. and um, and I got talking with Mike Smith, who actually was in, quite involved with the Auckland Free Diving Club too. He was one of the uh, early founders, him along with Fran Rose and Phil Clayton, kind of were the, the ones that started it. And okay. and Mike, Mike and I were kind of talking about well, we really wanted to just create a bit of a community of kind of like-minded, you know, really no dicks, basically of, <laughs> of people that um, who wanted to do free diving training, but for spearfishing. And um, we didn't want to kind of bore the ocean with it. We actually just like you said wanted to start with a reasonably small number of people and just grow it gradually and actually make it more organic where it didn't have to be one person was actually constantly being the instructor Um, because you know me personally I was actually starting to near the end of the AFC because I was running so many inductions and so forth I was actually starting to not enjoy it as much myself because I was spending all my time teaching others and never getting much of a chance to to train myself and so which can burn some people out you know don't get me wrong I enjoyed helping others but there were just times where I just didn't want to have to do that Um, and so we kind of had a bit of a a chat about well what what would we like to do here could we actually create something that's a little bit more self self perpetuating and self organized where you know maybe I'd Mike and I would take turns at writing up a plan. Um, we'd do a basic pool induction where you know anyone that came along would just teach them basics of how to breathe. Um, before a dive, you know, how to do your recovery breaths, how to, to rescue someone if they have a, a blackout, and and that way the people that, that were training could have confidence that everyone there would actually be able to rescue them if they ever had an, an issue. We kind of didn't didn't bore the ocean on that one, but we made sure people were safe. Yep. Um, and then we would write up plans, and we'd actually, you know, initially Mike and I were the ones that were writing up the plans, and, and actually we've got a lot of people on Spearfishing Fundamentals group on um, Facebook now that actually just join it, and they, they actually copy the plans. There's other clubs throughout New Zealand that often have a look at it, and they, and they take some of the stuff, and we're happy to share it, you know, it's yeah, like... Awesome. It, it, and it'd be great for others to, if they've got other ideas, would love to hear it too. But um, that gradually started to gain momentum. And um, I often would do, you know, I'd do ADA courses as well. And some of the people from that group would come along and do the ADA courses. And as they got more skilled themselves, they started to write the plans. And, you know, uh, it'd be a lot of different variety. Moss Burmester, who you've uh, interviewed, he comes along and trains a few bit and yep. always does some, some interesting plans. Um, he's a <laughs> bit of a, bu- a bugger for his CO2 drills, actually. Um, <laughs> We um after the CO two table, you know, you'll start with maybe maybe you're doing twenty five meter swims, you might do four four swims, so if you've got a minute to do your swim and recover and then you might drop that down to say fifty seconds to do your swim and recover and then you might drop it down to you know, all the way down to say 30 seconds to swim and recover or maybe one breath and then you bring it back up again Moss likes to do his pyramids the other way around where he actually you start with the hardest dives first and <laughs> oh, I tell you what it might work well for an ex-Olympian but it certainly hurt, hurts uh, old yeah. fellas like me oh it's bloody <laughs> good for you though that CO2 trouble, uh, training <laughs> I, I, I think my body loves it eh? it thrives on it. I mean I hate it at the time 
But um, afterwards, I get a whole host of benefits from it, including better mental clarity the day after and things like that. And yep. um, tell you what, talk about a full body workout, especially if you're doing like faster swimming, like it, t- it seems like his tables are designed to encourage you to do as well. Um, yep. Especially if you want two breaths instead of one. <laughs> yeah. uh, but no, nah, that sounds cracker. Hey, I was just going to say, I'm going to link up um, the Spearfishing Fundamentals group um, in the in the show notes. So people search Rob Harrison, no Spiro. All the stuff will be linked in there. But um, can guys come and find that group easily on Facebook if they type yeah. in Spearfishing Fundamentals? All right, cool. That's the one, yep. And we might have to get a bit of a blog post going on no Spiro where we talk about some of your techniques and, um, and guys can maybe grab that so i'll have to have a chat with you after the show maybe um cool cool uh any more sort of tools and techniques um for growing a community i just want to well, i'm just conscious of time rob and it's it's late it's later in the evening there i believe yeah um i guess yeah one of the um tip that we use is actually there's a lot of tools that kind of ha- can help uh, what tasks and prioritising what tasks you want to do as a committee and um, I don't know, there's a tool called Trello which is a, just a free free tool yeah. that you can jump on and it, it's actually it's a Japanese word Kanban um, Kanban board which has just been signboard but it's a way of kind of you can have a list of all the things you want to do and you can prioritise it as a group and you can kind of then move it across the board of you know stuff that we we're, we're agreed we want to do stuff we're working on stuff we've done and actually that, we found that as a, it's a really handy tool that you can just open up to anyone to see but then those people that want to get involved can pick up one of those tasks and and work on and and yeah, that's nice. certainly the, the type of culture that we, we we try to foster with the fundamentals and now actually I'll, I'll be honest i'm not writing many of the plans at all actually the group of it it's kind of gained a life of its own and if i'm out spearfishing on a on a training night which you know is all one of our unofficial rules is if you get the chance to go spearing don't come to the pool um <laughs> you know. nice love it but uh <laughs> yeah basically it's, it's nice to know that there's actually a you know a bunch of other peers that that uh do that too and we actually run the whole thing at cost like the the training for us is we just cover enough to cover the pool hireage and when we're training at the lake which we're doing twice a week now on tuesdays and thursdays um basically i've got a whole bunch of free diving rigs that as long as people are you know supplying the batteries for occasionally with the torches and stuff then we just keep using it and people have got lanyards and it's um it's a really good bunch actually we would often go for a beer afterwards uh there's a nice uh, little microbrewery that's opened up next to the to the, to the lake which is oh, a bit that's... unfortunate it doesn't help the weight loss but it's nah. uh <laughs> I was going to say, that. that's bloody terrible, but great for growing the community. And uh, I love a beer, especially after training. So yeah. uh, that's perfect. Hey, man, that's really cool, um, Veterans Vault. Uh, I think guys can get a ton out of that. And obviously we could talk for a lot about this because you, it's something you're really passionate about and you know a lot about. And uh, hopefully I can link up some of your social profiles and guys can reach out to you or, or find you through the Spearfishing Fundamentals um, Facebook page if they want to discuss a bit more about how they can grow their own community. I know it's um, something that gets kicked around a lot. Guys want to start a new spearfishing club or freediving group, so... Hopefully that's uh, been of uh, value for them. Yosemite National Park. California. Red Sox. Hang loose, bro. <laughs> Spearingmagazine.com. Did you say Spearingmagazine.com? I did, I did. What do you know about Spearing Magazine? I know that you can get eight issues for 30 US dollars plus shipping. But oh you've got to email it. Oh my God! Oh Lordy Lou! Ooh. But what you gotta do is you gotta email Jeremy at spearingmagazine.com. That's oh. right, J E R O M Y at spearingmagazine.com. Oh my God! Thirty dollars <laughs> US for eight issues turbo. That is phenomenal value. Email Jeremy at spearingmagazine.com. Jeremy at spearingmagazine.com. J E R O M Y at spearingmagazine.com. Guys, if you're anything like me and you're not much of a reader, you're more of a breeder, and you want something for you and your six kids to listen to, then get a copy of the Audible Snoop <laughs> Zero <Spiro> Free Trial. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, get breeding at audibletrial.com forward slash no Spiro. Less time reading, more time breeding. Save time. 80 minute audio book, 99 tips to get better at spearfishing. Just me and Turbo blabbing on, giving you more info on hunting techniques, shore diving, Spiro 2.0, and even free diving performance. Check it out. Uh, you can come to today's show notes and click on the Audible Trial. It'll take you through. You can get a copy for free. And, uh, 
and support the show while you're doing it. It's a no-brainer. Or head over to audibletrial.com forward slash Noob Spiro. Get hold of it today. Get breeding. Um, look, I want to go back just quickly. What's What's been um, like one of the toughest situations you've had in the ocean and what did you learn from it? Um, yeah, I guess there's, there's, there's a few, few um, bits and pieces, you know, that, like you're in, you're in the water, you know, stuff sometimes will go wrong, but I, I think probably one of the, it wasn't super dangerous, but it was a little bit of a, um, a gnarly situation, um, was when, um, I, I was out of Cowell actually, um, with a couple of mates and it was about January time frame. you know, um, from some of the other talks, you know, I think you might, uh, Pots might have mentioned it starts to get really sharky out in the Hurricane Gulf, you know, around that time frame. Kind of, there's a magical kind of temperature around about 20 degrees up to 22. The bronzies just seem to be everywhere and they're super active. And yeah. um, uh, the snapper often are also active at the same time, you know. And I, and I, I just shot a kingfish um, off at one of the spots off Cowell and, and, um, I, uh, I saw snapper everywhere, and I was thinking, ah, I was right next to the boat. I'll, I'll just gut the the kingfish and actually put the the gut out, and um, it will uh, should attract in some some snapper, yeah. um, you know. And um, <laughs> so I cut cut open the, the fish, and I've kind of had my hand in the gut. And the next thing you know, this thing bloody I got charged in the ribs like super hard. Like I thought actually my mates had jumped in off the boat, and one of the middle like rugby tackled me. And I'm looking around like what the hell just happened? And and when that actually occurred, my hand was actually in the the guts of the fish, and it kind of moved out a little bit when I got slammed. And I had my rib was aching actually. I actually had a decent bruise after that, and I was like, what the hell had happened? And um, a bloody bronzy had, had actually charged me. It was oh, getting ter- wow. ter- ter- territorial about the spot. Uh, it didn't didn't bite, and then. And that in itself actually showed me that, that they don't view you as food. It's more of a, t- a sort of territorial thing. And at least in New Zealand, if you're not a surfer, you tend to be okay. But uh, <laughs> uh, a bit different to, to Aussie. But oh, yeah, yeah. And, and when my hand kind of moved out of the fish, next thing you know, the bloody bronzy turned up right in front of me. And it actually bit down into the kingfish and it literally brushed the edge of my, my hand. I can oh. actually feel it feel it on my pinky and literally where my hand had actually just been in the guts of the fish basically the, the shark would have just gone through and just completely taken my hand oh, and I, wow. I, I, it was one of those situations where I, I just sort of watched it I was a bit shell-shocked I went and climbed <laughs> up in the boat and I kid you not I just basically uh um counted my fingers I just sort of stood there going one two three four five one two three four five and uh it was uh, yeah it was a bit of an eye open and a bit of a lesson to myself that you know that time of the year fish burlies and doing that sort of stuff is just a silly 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 thing to do yeah um I was pretty pretty much might have used one of my lives actually uh, <laughs> yeah yeah live and learn live and learn yeah no it's something we do here too is and um i mean it's bloody effective burly sometimes because the gut from the species that you know you've just um killed or shot um is probably exactly what the other fish of the same species want to eat so it can be really effective and um, yeah. I've shot some really good fish off the guts of the last fish I just shot. And so, but obviously, like, when you're working in an area where, yeah, where, where the, where the predation, predators, particularly sharks, are um, a bit more aggressive due to, like, you're talking about seasonal factors, you've got to be aware of that and, and make some, um, you know, cater your decisions accordingly, I guess. So, good insight. Yeah. yeah. Nah. Yeah. So. All right. Uh, a lighter moment. Um, have you got a good poo story? What's one of the funniest <laughs> things? <laughs> what's one of the funniest things that's happened to you out in the water? Uh, I, don't, I don't know that I have too many uh, uh, poo stories, actually, to be honest, but oh, probably yeah. one of the funniest moments, and my mate Kane's probably never going to forgive me for this because uh, he, even after four years, it's probably still too soon. But he, uh, <laughs> he, he bought a, uh, a brand new Rife uh, 130 gun, and um, he'd just taken it to the islands, actually, and uh, he got a yellow fin, and he was pretty chuffed about that. And we were up at the top of the Coromandel, actually, targeting big kingfish, and I, I jumped in first, and... Um, shot you know must have been in the high 20s one and so you know but i'd seen some bigger models and um we were taking turns that one person was driving the boat and the other person was doing drift dives through this particular area yeah and uh, and uh, so i'd kind of shot the fish dealt to it i was in the back of the boat and he jumped in and because i'd seen so many big fish we were like oh man you know you're gonna need a bigger float than what you've got so we kind of came up with a stupid rigged system where we had this massive buoy um and we had a float boat and we uh shark used the shark clip to click 
clip onto the um, onto the float boat and then onto his gun. And and he was, I was kind of dealing to the fish, you know, and, and I kind of heard him dive, you know, he dive down. And then uh, I could hear this noise like someone was being towed behind a boat. And I was like, what the hell's that? And I look up and there's Kane getting t- basically towed along by, it must have been a giant kingy, like a, a really good sized one. And he's getting towed like you would if he was getting towed behind a boat almost. <laughs> and, you know, and he's like fist pumping and whooping and like, you know, he was, he was pretty chuffed about it. And then the fish started sort of going out into deeper water and going down and it pulled the float boat under and oh, then it went wow. it was a little bit like Jaws movie you know he's going to need a bigger float but uh, <laughs> it basically it then hit this massive buoy that then was, wasn't going to go under and it was actually just too much pressure and it actually ah. snapped his, his shark clip oh. and uh so he lost the fish and his brand new gun oh. and uh, the, the poor bugger and uh, all he had left was this half piece of this bloody shark clip and, and this big massive float and uh, we actually turned that into a magnet and we ended up calling that the cluster clip which uh, <laughs> basically whenever someone does dumb uh, something really stupid amongst our group which another good mate of mine Chris perpetually seems to have you know uh, pretty much from the time that he uh, when he was filleting a kingy on the front of my tacky cat inflatable he stabbed it he pretty pre- <laughs> he pretty much uh, it was a pretty quiet trip home I can tell you that for free <laughs> but uh, yeah so that's oh, our, our, our cluster clip is basically something you definitely don't want to earn in my our group it's uh, uh but poor, uh yeah poor. no that was a bit of a hoot so he can laugh about it now but he was pretty tender for quite some time well that's an expensive <laughs> gun i feel for kane um but um it sounds like you got a good crew you guys can have a laugh and um and that's important i think that's super important in a crew um you don't want to be out on a, on, on boats that are too serious i tell you yeah, it's, it's all about having fun. Um, all right, man. Hey, what's in your dive bag? Um, head to toe. What's your What's your gear look like? Are you an ocean hunter fan? <laughs> yeah, well, actually, uh, I have to confess, um, Mike uh, often gets me to test a lot of his, his new gear. I actually had no real kind of appreciation for how much work goes into um, good oh. gear, and I'm sure with some of your sponsors, you'd know about this too. Oh, it's just yeah. that what what you see actually on the on the marketplace, you know, has gone through a lot of actually testing and refinement, and a lot of stuff doesn't actually make it, you know, if it isn't quite good enough. And um, I've been kind of lucky enough that Mike often, maybe it's because I'm often out sparing, uh, that Mike often uses me as a sort of crash test dummy for bits and pieces. And um, so I actually have 13 different wetsuits in the, in the Holy garage. Holy moly. <laughs> Yeah, I was doing a tally of it the other day, and it might be time to do a bit of a cull, but I am a bit of a magpie. Um, but yeah, gear-wise, I've just I've actually got a brand new um, moray uh, suit that Mike's just putting through the paces. I can't talk too much about it now, but it's, it's coming out soon. Um, it's it's really good. It's really warm. I like it. I, I use Roku fins. Uh, I used to use the commercials uh, when I was a bit fitter and kind of had a few more uh, horsepower in, in, in the pins, but uh, now mm-hmm. I've, I've moved down to mediums okay. now that I'm uh, slowing down a bit. Um I, I've got a Aqualung Micro mask. I kind of like using the same mask for free diving, for underwater hockey, for spear fishing. I don't really like chopping and changing just because it, it changes your perception. Often, I found when I was using a different mask for different activities, you know, so I, was, I was missing fish that uh, I normally wouldn't, um, yeah. and so I've just kind of settled on the the one reasonably low volume mask, and it, it fits my nose so, uh, pretty well. So, when you buy a mask, do you buy like two or three, have them all prepped yeah. and sitting there at the same time? Yeah, I've pretty much got yeah, two in my hockey bag, two, in my, two on the boat, two, you know, it's, it's yeah, like with, yeah. uh, um, I just wait until they're on sale and then tend to buy a few of them. But yeah, it's uh, once you find a good mask, eh, you just stick to it. Um, I, I, I think I sp- think spearfishing retailers should get on to that. They should do bulk deals, like, because like, I'll, I'll buy three or four masks, I'll buy three or four sets of booties at the same time. I'd love to see some bulk packs in all the shops. That's a good plan. Yeah, yeah it's a it's a great idea. Yeah. Um, and gun wise, I, I'm a pretty simple guy. Like I've tried roller guns and I like I like them, but I, I like simplicity. I actually just I like my Rob Allen's. I've, I've been pretty happy with them. Um, I did like the aim right. Um, I'm good mates with John Bengali, and I've done a bit of spearing with him over the years and a couple of comps and stuff. And I really like the aim right. So if I was ever going to be tempted, I'd probably consider that. But um, I, I've got a 110, a 120, and a 130 Rob Allen. Yeah, uh, that I, for, for New Zealand diving, it pretty much covers everything I need. You know, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, Oh, they're great guns too. They're bloody. I, I love them. I still love them. But um, I, 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 Duncan Henderson uh, has gifted me a roller, and this thing is the best gun I've ever felt. 
I've still yet to take it out and shoot a fish with it. I have to disgracefully say, but um, yeah, no, I I I love the Rob Allen. They can't go past them. Yeah, no, they're, they're good, great guns. Really simple. Uh, I've actually um, I, I used to use a single uh, for my one twenty. It's a single twenty mil band, but actually now I've just moved to two fourteens, and I and I swear the gun feels more accurate. And I definitely I don't get the sore chest plate, you know, from loading it all day, particularly when you do comps and so forth. Uh, by the end of the day, it can get a bit tender, and it. Um, it's no slower loading with two fourteens than it is a single twenty. You know, yeah, it's, right, uh, eh? yeah, it's uh, cool. something really simple. And you got a closed muzzle or open muzzle on there? Closed muzzle, yeah. just kind of nice and fast for loading. You yeah. know, it's um. And that's a comp gun, isn't it? It's a real comp gun. Yeah, that one. It is. Yeah. Single definitely. single wrap. Yep. Single oh, wrap. Gee, for talking my language. <laughs> <laughs> Even simple, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I love it. But basic set. It's particularly particularly for the guys starting out and the guys that are. Um, Oh, actually, like any level of sparing, it's good. What, what about reels? How do you feel about reels? I, I actually keep a reel on my um, 110. Um, I, I've, I've, my boat, I've got a Haynes Hunter 535, and I keep it on the dry stack at Gulf Harbour, which is just out of Auckland. And that pretty much means, you know, I can finish work at four and be out shooting kingies just after five. And I, I just keep a really, really simple kind of setup, my 110 with the reel gun there, and I keep a wetsuit on the boat. And it pretty much means that, you know, when the weather window's there, I can just go. And um, oh, it's awesome. just gold. It's really, you know, I keep the dive flag on the boat, but, you know, the, most of the spots I know. I have got myself in a, the odd pickle with uh, the real gun and I shot a reasonable kingy and got you know and a lot of current getting caught on rocks it's just not fun but yeah. uh, you know you just got to be a little bit more conservative with the shots and try and go for the stone shots if you can and, and just be you know a little more cautious but for going for snapper real guns are just gold you just got nothing to get tangled up on eh it's, um, yeah. it's great not not something I, re- I recommend to guys that are um, you know just starting out because you've already got enough complication dealing with everything else but because line management such a big thing especially with um, kingfish and stuff and uh, not to mention that they'll just drown you. They're bloody powerful things. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah no, cool. All right. Hey, any more gear you wanted to mention? Um, I, I keep it pretty simple, to be honest. Um, you know, that's that's usually the sort of the kit that I use. Um, yeah, a pretty simple guy. I kind of like to keep it pretty pretty straightforward, eh? Sweet. All right, cool. Hey, Sparrow Q&A, this is a faster-paced sort of round of questions. I'm going to ask you about four four of these, I reckon. Who, All right. Who has been the most influential people or person in your spearfishing? Um, yeah, okay. I guess there's two components to it. From a freediving standpoint, uh, John O'Sunnix from my freediving, you know, he was my instructor. Uh, he was the ma- master instructor that actually taught me to become an instructor and also my freediving. Um, made a massive difference. You know, he, he was, yeah, really instrumental and actually just brought in my eyes actually about how to approach things in a safer way and breathing and just different techniques. Yeah. Um on the spearfishing side, as I mentioned, you know, um, Gary Conway and Gra- Craig Carter were actually super influential guys for me. You know, as I mentioned, Gary's a bit of a cagey bugger at, at times with the spots, but uh, <laughs> he's starting to open up a little bit more. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, he's, yeah, definitely, uh, th- those two were just really awesome at, at sharing stuff. And, um, you know, I appreciate it. I probably haven't said it enough, but it's, I really appreciate the, the time that they, they, they gave me and how much they helped me out. Awesome. Hey, I was just going to say, back to Jonathan Sunnex, um, they they call him Johnny Deep, don't they? Is this his nickname? That's it. That is his nickname, yeah. No, right. he's, he's a... T- Top bloke. Oh, I like, and um, for guys that are sort of serious about sort of going past maybe their stage A free diving, is he someone you'd recommend? Yeah, definitely. I mean, he he's been doing it for so many years. The the thing that I, uh, I kind of noticed with him is he's just got this ability to be able to kind of tell how hard to push people and actually where. Um, yeah, where they need development, and he just hones right into it. He's super astute at picking it up, and I just think through doing probably thousands upon thousands of courses and actually helping structure a lot of the ADA content and so forth. He, um, yeah, he's a super talented diver, really nice guy, super down down to earth, but also just uh, he just just gets it, eh? And I think that um, I know Adam Stern's pretty bloody awesome too. I've you know uh, had a little bit to do with him when he's over in NZ, but um, yeah, like Jono be second to none in my opinion in terms of just yeah depth of experience and just ability to read people i think um a, a lot of guys are sport these days there are some bloody good um instructors getting around and uh it's good we've mentioned a couple here today hey during your 30 plus years of spearfishing sorry to make you feel old what is the <laughs> single what's the single biggest lesson you've learned um for me probably slowing down 
um, you know, a underwater hockey, being an underwater hockey player, you know, it's all fast and frenetic. Um, you know, slowing down is not only going to give you better bottom time, it's going to let you see more fish. Um, and, and, you know, you're going to be more chilled. And, and fish can read body language. They can see when you're you're intense and you're going for it. If you're chilled out, you'll, you know, you'll basically, you'll get a lot more fish. Um, you know, I've shot a lot more kingfish since chilling out. And then, and even at times, as I mentioned, sort of swimming away and looking completely disinterested. It's kind of a frame frame of mind. Just slow, slow down. Mm. You'll see more fish. And, you know, you'll actually enjoy it more too. You know, just kind of enjoying the moment a little bit. More. Man. All right. Which what spearfishing destination would you most like to go to? Um, I, yeah, I guess um, I did a pretty awesome trip actually for my 40th birthday with with Kane. We went to Tahiti and we went right down to near where John Pingali actually shot that um, his massive dog tooth tuna and and um, wahoo, and that was a pretty epic trip. I'd love to do something like that again. But it, we were talking about it the other day. Actually, Ascension Island would definitely be on my list if if I could get out there. It would be pretty epic. And just hearing you know Nat talk about some of the stuff that they got up to there was yeah, it's pretty inspiring stuff, eh? When, when you went to Tahiti, did you get out with? G with Gerard Gray? Yeah, yeah, we were with uh, G for a week. Oh, um, wow. yeah, we ended up Sport. doing a trip out to the seamount. Like, oh, now when we were talking about it, in, in hindsight, it was probably a little dicey. We took this tiny little pontoon boat, <laughs> actually two, two of them out uh, to the seamount, 120 kilometres offshore, <laughs> off already what was a pretty remote island. Yeah. And um, the only way that we could... Um, Sorry, I know we're sort of short on time, but the only way we could actually convince to have another boat come with us, the um, we convinced a, a fisherman to come out with us so we'd have a bit of redundancy. And um, <laughs> he, he went out on his own, and he, he kept catching wahoo. And then to keep the, the weight lo- uh, lower in his boat, he'd bloody gut and cut the heads of these fish off and throw it in the water. And the Galapagos sharks <laughs> went so ballistic. I've never been so terrified in my life, actually. <laughs> it actually went a little bit pear-shaped for me, and the... Um, like they got more and more aggressive, and I went back to the boat and came back out, and this bloody uh, Galapagos shark charged me really hard out, and I I ended up poking the bloody um, the, the the shark a little bit too hard with the slip tip, and the ice pick actually went in and pierced the skin, oh. and then I couldn't I couldn't bloody pull it out, and so it started to move away from me, which then my my gun actually because it, it put so much leverage above it, it actually caused it to fire, and the next thing you know I've got this bloody shaft going in in one side of the Galapagos shark and out the other, and I'm thinking <laughs> I'm going to lose my bloody rifle my uh, right uh, float and my float line uh, luckily we managed to get onto the boat and basically play it for about 20 minutes before it sort of tarkoed the line so much that it came out but uh oh nice <laughs> but that was a pretty spectacular spot um yeah i'd love to get back there but yeah ascension island would be pretty awesome too yeah, yeah nah okay cool hey last question rob um could you describe what the spearfishing experience means to you in one sentence yeah okay um have a crack yeah okay um for me it's kind of i guess um yeah, the ability, I guess, to get out and experience a bit of um, nature. Are and you, kind of just... Hang on, I, I'm going to interrupt you. Are you searching for your notes? Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's getting quite late in the night, but yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, for me, I'll, I'll... I'll give it to you again, and then you maybe you've had a bit more time to frame it up. It's harder to try and say something like this in one sentence, because, I mean, spearfishing probably means so much to you, but, but you yeah, have another go. Well, one, one sentence, what does spearfishing mean to you? Um. I guess a way to calm my mind, enjoy the outdoors, and gather a feed wrapped up in one sport. Really, you know that's that's what it means for me. Oh, nice! You you you, you summarise and paraphrase that one really well. Now, nah, awesome, Rob. Hey, I've had a blast chatting with you, man, and uh, I got to scratch my own itch a bit today because um, one of the things I'm really interested in is um, is growing a community, and uh, and there's always talk with guys starting new communities. So I think it's a, a really you you drop some big knowledge bombs today. So I just want to thank you for that. Oh, well, good. It's been my pleasure, mate. I hope if people can get something from it. That'd be awesome. It's, uh, yeah, and I'd love to hear how other people get on with it too. You know, other tips. To, I'm always learning. It's always good to hear from others as well. Yeah, cool. Hey, where can people come and find you? Uh, yeah, probably the easiest option is that Spearfishing Fundamentals uh, Facebook group. Um, I also have a, um, another a page, uh, New Zealand Freediving Experience, which is what I use to just kind of advertise when I'm doing um, AIDA courses. Okay. Um, I tend to do... Um, a lower number of them now but tend to go out to the Great Barrier and kind of do it in the, in the ocean rather than kind of in the lake and so forth um, so it's only do a few a year but if people are interested in that they're welcome to, to have a look but yeah if they want to find out more about the sort of training we're up to and the plans and stuff just join the Spearfishing Fundamentals and uh, it'll give them you know hopefully a few tips and um, yeah it'd be a good way of making contact Cool so Spearfishing Fundamentals on Facebook group and what was the what was the sorry with the other page for your courses? Uh, New Zealand uh, Freediving Experience so oh. I've got a web- website as well as there's also a Facebook group Oh awesome well, I'll, I'll link all this up in the show notes so guys can come and find it if they search Rob Harris. 
Rob Harrison. Harrison, Harrison, that's the one. sorry. Rob Harrison, Noob Spiro, that your interview should pop up somewhere in Google there. And uh, we, we chatted about heaps of stuff today, so there's going to be a few links in there. So come and check it out at noobspiro.com. Awesome, Rob. That's awesome. Thanks, Rick. It's bloody great talking to you, mate. Wow. Did you enjoy today's episode with Rob Harrison? If so, I'd love to hear about it on Instagram or Facebook. Just tag us in a post and uh, let us know what you thought of Rob. I thought there was some phenomenal stuff in there. I really like the the new competition uh, that they've sort of invented, which is you know 50% on the species and then 50% on the dishes you prepare after. I thought that was really cool. Really loved uh, Rob's insights, particularly into growing a spearfishing community as well. And I'd uh, love to hear what you got out of the interview. So look, reach out, shrek at namespiro.com. And I'd uh, love to hear what you think. But thanks for listening today, and uh, we'll see you again in a fortnight. Today's Dynamite Noob Spiro podcast is brought to you by spearfishing.com.au. That's right, the fine folks over at Adreno have been supporting the Noob Spiro podcast since about episode 18. And they help pay the bills around here. Just want to encourage you to check out spearfishing.com.au and use the code Noob Spiro. You can save 20 bucks on every purchase over 200. But it's just a great online shopping experience. The reviews are phenomenal. If you want to check out a new spear gun, new pair of booties, new pair of gloves, someone's used them before, they've written a review, it's on their website, it's all there right for, there for you. Head along to spearfishing.com.au and thank you for shopping with it. Today's major sponsor, Adrena. Hey guys, thanks for listening to today's show. I hope you really enjoyed it. As usual, we had a phenomenal guest. And uh, if you've ever got any guest suggestions, you can always email us, Turbo at Noob Spiro or Shrek at Noob Spiro. Give us any feedback you might have. But if you want to, you might you might be interested in connecting more and, and jumping in and joining our community. Turbo, how can people do that? Well, one of the things they can do is join our newsletter, The Floater. That's one way of doing it. So go to our website um, or go to our Facebook page and it says join there. So uh, you can do that. The other thing you can do is join the Noob Spiro community. Now that's uh, full of like-minded Spiros all trying to get better at spearfishing and uh, our guests get on there from time to time. We give a few tips away and that kind of thing. So uh, all good stuff. Shrek, what else can they do? Guys, follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Get a hold of uh, Turbo. He's always dropping a pose somewhere, and uh, check it. Yeah, just 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 join us. Thanks for uh, listening to today's show.